This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, we are joined by Mr. Corey Schnabel from Kansas City. What is up, Corey? Gentlemen, what's going on? How are you? Good. What's happening? We're, we're doing good, man. You know, it's uh, just another hurricane slash tropical storm <laughs> hanging out in the Gulf of Mexico. Today has been so gross. Just dumping us with horrible weather. But aside from that, everything's good. I mean, it's 2020. Are we that surprised by anything? Seriously. No, it's, <laughs> the 2020 memes like get me every time. I love them. It, but, it, but it's so true, though. It's like, what, like what's next? It, you know, it's it's been it's been ridiculous. I feel like the what's it's, next doesn't even surprise me anymore. It's like, oh, there's two hurricanes right. now, and there's murder hornets. Yeah. It's like, oh, that sounds crazy. Like, <laughs> let's just, all right, yeah. Think yeah, of no the craziest kidding. thing possible, and that's what's next. Yeah, more than likely. I mean, that I don't like, I don't the, even, like the monster from Stranger Things is going to start coming and just. <laughs> Be or some meteor, yeah, some meteor just heads right. in like right in the middle of Omaha, Nebraska, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> There's no telling, right? But anyhow, listen, you know, Corey, why don't you when we get started? Why don't you give everybody a little bit of background on you? Tell them uh, how you got in the insurance industry, a little bit about your agency, and then we'll start firing away. I do have some specific stuff for us to talk about, just based on you know some ex- exchange we've had online and, and I think you and I are on the same page about a lot of a lot of that and I want to get that out to the audience uh, but give them a little bit of background first yeah so my name's Corey Schnabel uh, born raised Kansas City area um, got into insurance by accident uh, 2008 I was out of college didn't know what I wanted to do bouncing between jobs uh, and I had a a guy that I went to college with is like hey I'm buying an all-state agency you can make 40 grand a year and I was like that's a million dollars. Yeah, absolutely. That like, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a lot of money. Let's do it. Um, and so just, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was 23 years old, started working for him, uh, kind of found out I had a knack for people um, in, in the people business and bought an agency in 2009, sold it in 2014, all with Allstate. Um, wasn't for sale, but everything's always for sale type of thing, but somebody wanted it bad enough and offered me a price good enough for it that I sold it. Um, I always kind of knew I wanted to flip over to the IA world and had no idea how to do that. Um, so in 14 and 15, I started reaching out to the carriers, trying to get contracts, all that type of stuff. Um, I had a good grade card, for lack of better words, at Allstate as far as retention, sales, referrals, all that type of stuff. So we started gaining traction with the carriers, started getting all of our contracts in 2015, and went live, uh, opened the doors January 1st, 2016. So we're just under five years in. Um, I don't know it all. I never will know it all. And I'm kind of okay with just walking in every day to a new fire to put out. And it kind of keeps me on my toes. I, I, I'd get bored doing the same thing over and over. I could tell you, man, it's kind of cliche to say it, but I'm, I'm the same way. You know, I'm, I don't know everything. I don't pretend to know everything. The one thing that, that makes me, you know, that I would say leads me to be somewhat successful is the fact that I I can identify what I don't know and where I'm weak. And and then I, you know, work around that. 
I think that's one of the biggest issues we all have to face is being transparent and being able to identify our weaknesses. And then you can hire people in that have that as their strength and it makes you better overall. So no, I think you're a million percent correct. And I feel that was one of my biggest downfalls kind of growing up, not even growing up, but in my early elementary insurance agent days was trying to be everything to everyone. When you're with a captive carrier, you kind of have to be, you know, it's a manufactured home. If it's a trailer four hours away, it's like all this type of stuff. You're so starving for growth. Like you just have to do everything. And you spend so much time just kind of going down those rabbit holes that you don't want to go down that by the end of the day, end of the month, end of the year, you're like, my numbers aren't where they want to be. Um, how do I fix it? But I, I kind of feel that, you know, with all the, the shiny gold and shimmery auto, or objects all everywhere right now, it's like, it's really easy to kind of get lost on how you got to where you're going, right? Like, I mean, it's like, you know, if you've driven the same reliable car for five years in a row and it's getting you everywhere you want to go and good gas mileage and good technology, and then you see that brand new car on the side of the road, you're like, oh man, that's awesome. I need that. You're like, wait, this thing's always got me to where I want to go. So I kind of feel that's where I've settled down a little bit was, hey, I don't need to try every marketing program out there. Hey, I don't need to try to sell every policy that calls me randomly. Like, I need to figure out what I'm good at, focus on what we're good at and blow that up versus spending the time on things that I don't care about, I don't like, I don't want to mess with and just really kind of laser focusing versus a flashlight focus on that type of stuff. Yeah. So why do you think it's so hard for our peer group to understand that? Because I feel exactly the same way. You know, it's, um, we, we talk about it all the time, but one of the reasons why we have a good level of success in our agency as far as closing and, and retaining business is we just draw a line in the sand and we say, this is who we're going to work with. These are the ideal prospects for us to go after. This is all we're going to go after. We're not going to deviate from it because we know if we do, we're going to end up dealing with things that we don't want to have to deal with. And, you know, we, we end up having more success that way. And I think that a lot of times our peer group gets so caught up in either high premium deals that are just really garbage risks or um, just something that for whatever reason they think, well, so-and-so writes a lot of this, so I should too. And they, they deviate from that plan. And the next thing you know, they're the, the train's off the tracks and they have no plan. No, and I, that's actually a really, really good question. And I, and, I'll, and I just have seen your post a lot lately, you doing the whole 30 and stuff like that. So let me kind of tie it into a diet, right? Like if you're out of shape, and let's just say out of shape is equivalent to the new business owner, right? Or you want to get healthy, not even out of shape. Like you just want to get healthy. If you Google, let's get healthy. How many thousands of products come up? How many diet fads, how many wraps, pills, um, iPhone application. And it's like, you almost are just like, holy shit. You know, it's like, it's too much. It's like when the kid walks into the candy store and he's like, oh my God, like everything's (laughs) everywhere versus like, I know I want gummy bears. Right. So I think that all of these people out there that are trying to take their business to the next level, whether that's sell their first policy, sell a million dollars in premium, sell $10 million in premium. There's so much that is out there. They just need to put blinders on and kind of realize like, at the end of the day, you know, back to the diet thing, guess what? If you want to lose weight, you know the easiest thing to do? Wake up at 5 a.m. and go for a two-mile walk run. And then when that gets easy, do it for three miles and do it for four miles. And, you know, like, and that's hard work, right? There's not a pill for that. There's not a, you're not going to get back that two hours of your morning, but it's just hard work, you know? And so that's kind of what we've really kind of figured out with our industry or with our kind of niche market is it's hard work. And you've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the princess with that, right? So it's, we're not going to go out there and just try to be everything to everyone, but we know what we want to do and we're going to work hard to get to where we want to be. Yeah, it's funny. I listened to Will Smith in an interview probably going on 15 years ago now, but somebody asked him about his diet and how he was in such good shape for one of the movies he was in. He's like, he's like, I run six and a half miles a day. I don't have to worry about my diet. If you run six and a half miles every day, you can eat whatever you want. Yeah. I'm like, you we know what? That's 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 pretty elementary, but it's also true. Well, you said right? the keyword yeah. elementary, and that's what I was just talking to my vice president this morning, Kristen. I had to drop my car off for service, and she picked me up. And that's that's one word that was actually brought up as elementary. Like, there's nothing we do that we are trying to sell you. Like, and I, I'm not knocking anybody. Like, we're not trying to sell you a marketing program. We're not trying to sell you leads. We're not trying to sell you the magic bullet. We're literally saying we'll show you exactly what we do. Now, to the to Will Smith's thing. How many people have the capability to wake up and run six and a half miles every day? 
literally everybody. I don't have the capability to do it for one day. Yeah, but you could. Well, you do. Or but the he, capability. I don't have the willpower exactly. to do that. Though. And that's the that's the two difference. Like you have the capability, and it might take you four hours, right? right? Like you don't you don't <laughs> want to do it. Like, and that's the thing is like when I tell somebody like, hey, how'd you get twelve hundred leads a year from mortgage lenders? It's like I beat down their doors. I stopped by ten times. I emailed them. I called them. Like. And, you know, a lot of people are like, shit, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that, which is great because right. I will do that, right? And, like, I will get those leads that we're closing at 50% and that it's sticky business. You know, like, I will do that because I'm not trying to work harder. Like, I am, you know, I'm at the ripe old age of 37, but, man, I'm not trying to do this much longer where I'm just out there grinding, grinding, grinding. So it's like I want to put myself in a better life and put my agents in a better life with working smarter, not harder. You know, and that's an age-old additive, but, like, that's what I would focus on. Well, and I think, too, if you think about it, the technology piece really should not muddy the waters nearly as much as it does, right? The problem that we have in the industry is FOMO, number one, Mm -hmm. is, you know, you've got the cool kids club. So a couple of agencies get virtual assistants, and then they talk about virtual assistants and how much it's helped their agency. And the next thing you know, everybody has to go out and get a VA because you can't participate in online conversations unless you refer to your VA. Or the newest shiny software product comes out or lead gen source or whatever else, and everybody flocks to it instead of stopping and looking at, okay, What is it that I'm really trying to solve here? What do I need in my agency? Look, I get shiny object syndrome too. I'm not bashful about talking about it. I tell everybody all the time, my number one shiny object syndrome issue is the fact that I came back from Innovation 2019 and launched Personal Lines. (laughs) That's it. Is that really what my core competency is? No. Why did I do it? Because I let Justin Sloan talk me into it. He told me I already have the CRM. I already have the the marketing pieces. I already have all of this. I'm just leaving money on the table and I'm competitive enough. I don't want to leave money on the table. Well, guess what? I don't really like personal lines. (laughs) I don't want anything to do with it. I have a very difficult time reconciling having a conversation with Mr. CFO that pays us 50,000 a year in commissions. And then my next phone call is Ms. Johnson, who's upset because her homeowners went up 20 bucks a year and wants me to shop it everywhere. I'm not saying that either one of them is better than the other. I just know that my business model is built around Mr. CFO and not Mrs. Johnson. Johnson There's agencies that are built for Mrs. Johnson. That's where Mrs. Johnson should shop. (laughs) And and you, you get it right. And like Justin Sloan, he's big in the investment landlord properties, right? Like that's, that's been his shtick the last two years. He found that market. He got it. And he's seizing that market. Absolutely. Go get it back to what you were saying. Just because, I'm just going to say this because it's the front of mind. Nick Ayers is doing YouTube videos. You can't think that I have to do YouTube videos to be successful. Like people want to get, they get so close to it. It's so close to their eyes. They need to take a step back and just look at it and say, how does this even fit into what I'm doing? And the problem is, and this is going to sound very repetitive. The problem is people don't know their problem, right? So they're trying Mm -hmm. to take a pill every morning for that's going to cure something. And they don't even know if they have something, but they just hope that pill cures the thing that they might not even have. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, and that's that's what kind of what I was getting at when people go in and they're making these decisions and they're looking at technology. I honestly think that when agents are weighing their technology options and what they want to invest in inside their company, they're not looking at it through the right lens. They're looking at it as what can I do to replace people or what can I do to operate more efficiently when, in my opinion, they should be looking at it and say, how is this going to enhance the client experience? If you're enhancing your client experience, you should be operating more efficiently and you should be uh, optimizing the human capital inside your organization to deliver a better experience to your client by automating those things that you can. But so many people want that magic wand. I deal with it with Killing Commercial all the time. People, 75% of the people that I talk to about coming into the program are not right for the program. And I have to be the one to tell them that because they haven't, they're looking for something to save their agency. They're looking for that magic Mm -hmm. wand that can be waved and just automatically create production. When I can tell you, I can teach people a process, but you still have to deal with it. And the analogy I use all the time, I've probably used it a hundred times is I can, I can give you a Ferrari and I can put it in your driveway, but unless you fill the tank with gas, you ain't going anywhere. And that's what the deal is. I can provide the platform. We have a rock solid process, but you still have to work. You know, it's still heavily based on prospecting and cold calling. We're just doing it in a more intelligent manner than a lot of other agencies are. 
Absolutely. And that's what I think, you know, back to what I was saying, like people don't know where they're missing the bus at. Right. And that's the thing. It's like maybe you're quoting a shitload, but your close ratio is 12 percent. Well, then if you come to me and say, Corey, how do I get more leads? I'm going to say you don't need more leads. Let's focus on making sure your people are quoting these people correctly. Or maybe you're closing a lot, but you're not getting more leads, you know. Uh, and that's where I think that's where I see the avenue is to help other agents in like just they need guidance, right? We were all there. We've all been where like we didn't know what to do. Um, in the whole technology thing, I think this is just a really funny thing because I didn't know we were doing the podcast today. So I'm literally here about two feet from my computer screen because that's where my audio jack is. So if you saw me right now, it looks like I'm like handcuffed to my desk listening to you guys and talking to you guys because I wasn't prepared <laughs> for this. So I'm not the guy that goes out and buys all the technology, but I am the guy that's going to go out there and be like, man, how can I refine what I already have in house? that's going to get me one or two blips here and there. These one or two blips here and there, if you're doing that every quarter, is going to take you to where you want to be at. And that's what yeah. I want people to understand is like, I, I am, thank God I'm not on video, but like I am not some great looking guy with a, uh, you know, a Stanford education who's pulling up in a Ferrari that I, I don't have attributes that nobody else has. Like I have what you have. So like you can do this. And like, that's what I want to encourage people to do is whenever I talk to people is like, guys, like you, I can literally show you how you can go get more business. But do you want to go get more business? Do you want to put in, you know, the six and a half mile run every morning to get that business? Well, listen, man, I know you've got a bitch in Kansas City chief suit that you can put on. So. I do. I do, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about it all the time, too. You know, my one of my go to's is I don't believe we should talk about a sales funnel. I think we should talk about a sales cylinder. I want as much coming out the bottom as that I have going into the top. And you can achieve that if you're only filling it with the right stuff at the top. We get, you know, and it's a different market, right? For what we do going after middle market commercial business, we're apples and Volvos from your agency that's going after mortgage referrals and all of that other stuff. So we actually have the ability to, to do that. You do to a certain extent, but not nearly as customized as what we can. I can literally say we're only going after this demographic, demographic of account and nothing else. And then that's all we're going to go after. And we won't deviate from that. So if we purify the leads that are coming in before we actually dump them into the pipeline in the process, we operate more efficiently. Whereas if you have a bunch of stuff coming in and you're getting it from third parties or, you know, people who are buying leads or getting click to call or whatever else, you don't have the ability per se to sanitize everything before you put it into your process. So you're going to have some level of attrition to begin with. Yeah, but I think the key word you said there's process, right? Like you created a process, you've laser focused that process where you know what you want. So the second Joe Blow from whatever sh shop calls you and says, hey, will you quote my insurance? You already know where this conversation is going before the conversation even goes there because you have such a process that is tried and true over and over. And like, so me and you, to your point, we are completely opposite how we do our business, but we do the exact same thing as you guys. We have a process. We know what we go after. We know the mortgage lenders we want to go after. And we know when we get our leads, this is how we're going to do it. So I love the fact that you guys have put on your blinders and said, yeah, there's stuff over here. There's stuff over there. But all of that's going to do is slow me down on getting to the top of the mountain of the, you know, what I've already built. So I really commend you guys on that. Well, and the same thing too is, you know, it's funny because with, with people that go through the commercial training stuff that we do, the first thing that I have every agency or every producer, depending on what the relationship is, do is, is put together a business plan. What I found is that by and large, our peer groups have no plan. I mean, and I, I don't mean that is me being condescending. I mean, that is in, I ask them to write a business plan and they have no clue what I'm talking about. And I mean, I think that that's part of the issue is you have to be able to storyboard kind of the journey that you think that you're going to go on and identify what you need to piece in and um, supplement with technology, how you're going to hire, you know, what you want your culture to be. All of your processes need to be defined, replicable and trainable. And I don't see that by and large across the board. You know, it's one reason I'm able to help people you know, do what we do and basically just teach them a process. But at the end of the day, I just, I, I think that so many people have found that there are low barriers to entry to get into the insurance game that you can take somebody who's just 
average, and I mean no disrespect by this whatsoever, but you take someone who has an average skill set. They don't have a CIC or a CRM or any letters behind their name. They don't really have technical insurance knowledge, but they're willing to work hard and they can study enough to pass the test to get their license. Guess what? Market access isn't a problem anymore. You can join aggregators. You can use wholesalers for both admitted and non-admitted paper. And at the end of the day, you, I could literally have my son who's getting ready to graduate from high school in the spring go launch his own agency. And as long as he was street smart enough to figure out the different areas he needed to look at, he could have an agency up and running in a relatively quick period of time. And if he's willing to work hard enough, he's going to sell some insurance to people. Now what happens? Like, do you have a viable business or are you just going out writing revenue as quick as you can and hoping to mask any inefficiencies in your operation because you haven't drilled down on anything outside of the fact you can go out and call on enough people to get some people to buy from mm-hmm. you? No, it's a, no, it's a great question. I, I can tell you I was the guy that you just said. So was I. Ago when I started Allstate, you know, it, it was – Okay, my payroll this Friday's X. I got this in the bank. Sweet, I got two hundred bucks in the bank. I can go take my <laughs> wife out to eat on the business. You know, like it was very a survive and advance. You know, almost March Madness type mantra. Um, and then, and I'm glad. I am very, very thankful because we are four, five, six times more successful on the independent side as far as growth, revenue, retention, all that type of stuff. So I'm glad I kind of took my took my beatings at Allstate and kind of learned that. Hey, it sucks. You know, those, those payroll checks. So when it's time to write it, you don't have enough in the bank. And believe me, I've freaking been there. Like, and I'm glad I learned that lesson as a broke 26 year old versus a 37 year old with two kids and a wife and a mortgage and car payments and all that stuff, because I've learned some lessons the hard way. So um, I've got, I've got a couple questions. You, you obviously were with Allstate for a little bit and you said that it was kind of always in the yeah. plans to, to go independent. What was the, the driving yeah. factor behind that? Or, um, you, you know, what were your thoughts on that? And then, Second, what's been the biggest thing that you've learned since going independent? Great questions. Um, so the first question, I'm not a corporate guy. Um, it, it's not in my blood. I j- I'm not a be governed, get on this webinar, hop on this conference call, make sure you show up at this event type yeah. of person. So at a very, I guess, young age, for lack of better words, I realized I was good at selling insurance. And I was good at building relationships to the point where when I got acquired, I was like top 1% in the nation, which is why I got acquired. But I also learned that Allstate wasn't for me. So it was kind of one of these things that I'd always talk to independent agents and they're like, your close ratio is two times higher. Your commissions are higher. It was always one of those things that I always knew it was better, but I kind of didn't believe it Mm -hmm. was better type thing. Um, So the guy buying me out in 2013 was almost just a launch board to kind of kick me in the butt to get me to the next level because I would have probably wrote out all state because I knew it. I could close my eyes and do a quote. I was successful. I was making the money I wanted to make, or I thought I wanted to make. Um, so it was just always kind of there relatively in front of me. Um, and then you, you'd mentioned your second question was what, what do I find the biggest differences are good and bad? Is that what your next question was? What your biggest learning experience was going independent. Oh, it was a lot. Um, I can tell you, I, I really didn't sleep a lot the first six weeks because I was very stressed mm-hmm. out. Um, because I, so when I sold my Allstate agency, I made a profit. I took the entire profit of that agency, rolled it over here. So when we opened up the day one, like literally every dollar we were paying out the first 12 months was like my personal money that like I would, <laughs> I had already been taxed on that, you know, so I'm writing payroll checks. That's literally my money, you know? So it was nerve wracking on top of that learning six or seven new systems was, was different, you know, because I can tell you all day about uninsured, underinsured motorists, BI limits, stuff like that. But when you have to learn it in traveler system and Safeco system and nationwide system versus all state system, which I could do with my eyes closed. Plus I was training two brand new people to do it. Um, it was very nerve wracking. So the hardest thing for me day one was I knew where I wanted to go. Me person, Corey Schnabel. I know this is where I want to go, but I had to look at it. I got two employees here. They don't know anything. I have to appease these six or seven regional managers now. So my head was spinning a lot. So the easiest part, getting leads, selling insurance, that was in the bag. That's, mm-hmm. That stuff was cake. But it was just all the other type of stuff. you know. And one thing I want to kind of double back on, you had mentioned when I kind of wanted to know that I was going yep. independent. Well, I work with a lot of really um, successful real estate agents and mortgage lenders who are close personal friends, like very, very close personal friends. And I kind of got tired of hearing 
you know, they'd send me somebody, but they'd also send it to a, an independent agent and just say, Corey, you know, for the best benefit of our clients, we love you, but we have to look out for what's the best for them. So they're sending it to me and then some other random dude. Well, I'm a competitive person. I would have like negated all commissions on these just to win the policy, but obviously you can't do that. So I just kind of got tired of knowing I was losing business that I could have gotten if I wasn't handcuffed by Allstate. Um, so yeah, you mix that between the corporateness of Allstate, you know, them telling you when you had to be open, what you had to do, all that type of stuff mm -hmm. with losing business purely because I couldn't compete. It just got to be enough for me. Sure. Know? I'm interested in sort of the learning curve for you in systems from leaving a, an organization like Allstate, which obviously has systems in place and, and all of that, which makes it easy to train everybody in their organization to not having anything at all when you open the first day and having to figure out how to put something in place that's going to allow you to be successful from a technology standpoint. Yeah. So one of my good friends who's a member of this group as well, Ben Cohen, he's out of Kansas city. Um, he was always kind of in my ear because he was met life. And then he went to go independent probably 2011, 2012. So when we really started kicking the tires on this, I went to Ben. I was like, Hey Ben, what do I need to do? He's like, get easy link. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll get easy links. Like it wasn't a, I'm going to go shop these three carriers. Ben was successful. He just told me what to go get. So I kind of just did what he told me to do. Well, then when you get in there and you have it, it's still a monster learning curve of, okay, I got I got to do this. Then I got to bridge over to the carrier site. Then I got to do this. Then I got to send in these trailing docks for this carrier. But this carrier wants me to e-sign it. So it was really just kind of seeing what travelers wanted different than how tra Safeco wanted. Or Safeco is going to allow a 20-year-old roof. Travelers only allows a 15-year-old roof. But you can actually bind that policy in Safeco. They reject it on the back end. So it was just so many little tidbits of information that, I just really had to organize and I overestimated how quickly I would pick it up. So that was my frustrating thing is like, because I had people to quote, right? So like day one, we literally had people to quote, we're getting them quotes out and they're ready to bind. But now I, I don't know how to bind yet because I haven't ran the MBR and oh no, I just ran the MBR and the rates went up 200 bucks. Well, crap. Now I got to go back into this policy. So the subtle nuances of each carrier was really, really hard for me to pick up. And honestly, they're still hard for me to pick up. Like I'll holler out like two or three times a day to like my staff and be like, hey, Safeco, do they do ACV on this? And they're like, no, they don't. Okay, great. You know, because you have so many options out there. So it was hard to gather that. But now that I've got such an elaborate team, we all just kind of work with each other to, to pick each other up on those type of things. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. Um I ran the agency by myself for a good period of time before I brought even one employee in and invested pretty significantly in some of the systems and stuff that we have in place to make sure that when they got here, uh, there was stuff that, that would help them and, and make them more successful. Uh, but I, I stepped back. I, I've been nothing but independent my whole career. I was a producer originally at another agency. Then I was a partner in another firm for eight years and then launched Florida risk four years ago. And, you know, the difference probably for me is that I didn't know anything different than being independent to begin with. And I basically had eight years to think about all the things I would do if I launched my own agency, because literally that's all I thought about every day. I wasn't getting listened to by the other partners. I wasn't respected for my opinion. And so I ended up operating from a very um, dark place most of the time. And when I launched my agency, it was very, very simple. I was just going to do everything I'd been complaining about for eight years and it should work. That was literally the experiment. And guess what? It did. Mm hmm you know, I and think that's it, amazing. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting too because you know a lot of people. You know, it seems like I have a lot of friends that have agencies that literally started right out of school. You know, college, high school, whatever, with Allstate for whatever reason, Allstate, and now they're all you know they're independents. But I mean, that same story that you told is one that we've heard. I, mean, I was just saying, how many how many people we had on here that same exact thing started with Allstate and then went independent after a few years? It's, I swear to God, it's been like like ten people. Which yeah. you know, and and I tell people like I can't. I bet I bet I've sat down with five ten people in the last eighteen months that say I want to get insurance. What can you tell me? Like what what should I do? What should I not do? And I always pay 
the highest accolade to Allstate or to Farmers or Farm Bureau, that these captive carriers that put a billion dollars into their education department, how well they train people under their umbrella. And I tell people too, I'm like, if you honestly want to know what I would do, and this is probably against the grain with the IA side, go work for Allstate for three months, let them send you to their training, learn everything under the sun. And at that point in time, if you like insurance, then be a free agent and shop yourself on the open market. Because if somebody walked into my agency and said, hey, I've been with State Farm for six months, I learned everything about insurance. Can I start for you? That is a different player than somebody saying, hey, I'm a 4.0 student with a marketing degree that I went to insurance for flood mitigation. Like, I don't care what you know. It's like, I care how you can get out there on the streets, right? Like, so the fact that you know the information, you can beat down those doors. That's what I find very impressive. Yeah, you know, I think that it's that if there's one thing that I have thought was consistent across everybody that's come from any of the captives, it's that they really do appreciate um, the structure that they yeah. were in, that, that that they were taught that there was a, you know, training in that environment. And, you know, look, I learned a lesson really early in my life. You know, I had worked for a grocery chain running grocery what? stores and I decided that, yeah, how about that? Nobody ever heard that about me before. Right. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I thought I, I got sick of work in the hours. I got sick of, you know, always having to answer to the man and all of that. And so I decided I was going to go start my own company. And this was pr- long time before my insurance days. Well, guess what? I found out real quick. It's a whole lot easier to manage a, a business when there's already a structure there and you're implementing what people have already proven works than when you have to a come identify what needs to happen, then come up with a process around it, then train everybody on that process and make sure it's executed to perfection mm-hmm. every day. I I got my rear end kicked by life for a solid two years and it was the best thing that could have happened to me. And, and to your point, I'd much rather happen when I was 26 than 47. Yep. yep. You know, you it's know? just like saying, hey, should I buy a McDonald's franchise? I can only make 120000 a year. Or should I go start Mike's Burgers? I can make four hundred grand a year. But to your point, you step in, it's plug and play with McDonald's. You know, And you can knock it all you want, but people make their living off running all state franchises, state farm owning it. I That's not my thing. You know, So to your – I went for the, the path less traveled, and it kicked my ass. But guess what? my mountain's going to be a lot higher at the top than theirs. And that is not a freaking knock to anybody at all. But that's just my motive to this. Like, I want to be the top dog. And when I say top dog, I don't mean financially. I mean, like, Traveler sends out, like, reports every month showing, like, who's number one. I want to see number one. Like, I don't care about what the commission's associated with that. It's like, I just want to be number one, you know? And I realized there was limits to other things I was doing. So this is going to give me the quickest access to getting to that number one spot. You know, it, it's like the auto owners life apps report that comes out every for month. Sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my favorite. I can't wait till the time we actually show up on it at all. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it motivates the right people, right? Like, I mean, I, I just feel the right process creates the right results, you know, and so many people out there want to go out there and they want to focus on the results, which I love results, but sometimes you can mistakenly fall into results. So here's another conversation for you after this. I just got somebody sent me a $200,000 commercial policy and said, hey, can you be my agent on this? Guess what? I have no idea where to start. That fell on my lap, right? So I can't go out there and be like, oh, sweet. I wrote $200,000 in commercial last year because that's not going to happen again. On the flip side, if you're making the right relationships and you're doing the right things on the front end, the back end falls into place, right? And that's where I think so many people, they focus on the bottom line. They focus on how much commission do I make? You know, there's that book, you know, um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but a lot of agents talk in there where they pretty much focus on the bottom dollar, cut every penny out. Don't overpay people. Do everything you can to maximize your margin. That's not my philosophy. My philosophy now, is how do you grow like that? my margin? You don't. You grow. I think yeah, you but- grow. You, the, the one at the top grow, but everybody else doesn't grow. And like, that's not me. I'm a team mentality. Like I am, I want my producers. I tell every single one of my producers that I want them to be on track for six figures by year. Right. That simple. And I want to yeah. help them get there. It, it's I want to help them get there because guess what? If they're happy, they're writing business, they're making good money, the agency life is better, the agency attitude's better, they're happy, I'm happy, versus me making an extra 20, 30, 40, whatever it would be a grand a year, great, but they're not living the life they want to live. You know, so if you just surround yourself with people that are happy and people that care about your business as much as you care about your business, the ceiling is there's no ceiling. You you blow the roof off the ceiling and say, How high do we want to go? 
Yeah, I think that that's something that I've noticed by and large is that the, your, the philosophy on how you should handle, you know, employee compensation, equity opportunities for team members, all of those things, that's probably one of the most polar discussions among agency owners. Absolutely. And it's, you know, and, and I've seen both sides of it, but I'd rather give everybody an opportunity to ultimately be successful and do what they want to do and be happy doing it because – like you, I know it's going to get me to where I want to be too. And I'll sleep a whole lot better at night. I don't ever want to be perceived as the guy, you know, is, is Scrooge. You know, the, I'm counting every single penny and listen, man, I'll be the first person to tell anybody. If, if you are looking for somebody who is just crushing it from an operations standpoint in maximizing every ounce of profit in their agency, you can keep on driving past my front door. It ain't going to yeah. be here. What I'm really, really good at, is having big picture vision, knowing what we want to do and, and build the business around that and driving top line revenue. That's what I do. I have been forced during COVID to sit back and look at a lot of the places that were losing money in the agency where we shouldn't and fixing those. So for me, COVID has been awesome. Not only are we not skipping a beat in producing business, but I've actually had to, I've had the time to sit back and say, Oh crap, man. I mean, I'm spending that much here. I really probably don't need to spend that. And for me, it was as simple as just printing out the freaking bank statement one month and seeing all the stuff coming out of there and identifying, are we even using this as a team? Like think about how many small subscription based things I could possibly have that were between $9.99 and $19.99 a month. I found several thousand dollars. Mm. Yeah. Well, you brought up a point too, you know, whenever, like, I mean, to your point, the number one thing that I see commented on the IAOA page is how do I pay my new producer? And I will always tell people how I pay my producers and I always get backlash. You're never going to do that. that. That's not sustainable. Da, da, da. But guess what? If you're going to pay what everybody else pays, you're going to get the same employee that everybody else gets. Like I want to pay more. I want to expect more and I want to get more. Now, once again, I'll say it again, you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find those princes, but you get the right people in the right roles that appreciate they're making more money. They will go to fight for you every single day. There's no such thing as a time clock in my office. They know what they need to get done. They come in when they need to get done. They leave when it's done. It's absolutely that simple. you know. And, and I don't say this to puff my own chest, but for all the people that tell me I, I pay my employees wrong or I give them too much or the equity options or the, uh, the profit sharing options, Let's compare our books. And I don't say that as like a, a peacock contest. I say it as like, okay, like you're doing this better than what you're telling me. So let's see who writes more business with my way. Like, and if we at the end of the day say, okay, well, I'm paying my agents more, but they're also writing 60% more than anybody else. So if you take that 60% growth they're doing, you squeeze down my margins, we're still actually making more. You know, it's, it's the, the Walmart mentality. Okay, sure. We'll sell 5,000 of these for only a quarter profit each versus the guy that sells 300 of them. We're still making more money, right? And and that's what I want to do. I want to implore my people to not be employees. They're not employees. They're, they're my friends. They're my family. And that's cliche. Everybody says culture, 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 culture. It's the buzzword. I get it. But that's truly how I feel. And that's truly how it's always been in this agency. If I want to give you the tools to be as successful as you possibly can. You know, I think it's interesting when you look at the threads that you get that, that we see sometimes about people going back and forth specifically about compensation and equity it's almost like you could draw a line in the middle of a piece of paper and the, the agencies that have the highest top line and are perceived to be the most successful are actually the ones that are less greedy and are giving more to their team and doing what they need to do to develop people and reward them for their performances, whether that be profit sharing, equity stake, opportunity, any of that. And you look at the other ones and it's like, you've got people that have been running agencies for 30 years and they can't get past a certain threshold. And they're adamant that their way is right, but they're, they're, they're sitting there preaching to somebody triple their size who's done it in a third of the time. You know, and I, I just think that sometimes we need to, to open up our minds and expand our thinking to realize there's, there's more than one way, right? The internet is good and bad for that very reason. I could go out right now in a public forum and I can post my thoughts on something or I could ask a question. Then I have to sit there and think about every single answer that yeah, comes back to me. Then like, I have it's to annoying almost. Yeah, I have, 
I have to research, okay, well, this person said I should do it this mm-hmm. way. Let me go look at their profile. What size right. agency? Are there? Oh, they're, they're a spend one, all your time they're doing a one man. They're a one man life right. shop. Why are you giving me advice as a middle mm-hmm. market commercial agency? And I think that's where we get dangerous because with social media, it's so easy to connect large aggregations of agency owners. And look, all of us think we're doing it right. And guess what? In our mind, we are, you know, in in our agency, it may be what's best for us. But what's best for me, I can assure you, Corey, is not what's best for you. And it's not going to be what's best for the average person in IAOA. So typically, you know, or, you know, Cass's insurance mastermind or some of these other groups. Well, that I'm social, in, how easy you know, to just make I, it look like everything is, you know, everything is all peachy on all fronts. Like, I mean, you, you, yeah, well, that's right. the other thing. So it's like a lot of times you're not even getting an accurate measuring stick. It's well, no. that's the thing too with social media in general. Yeah. It's like, you know, you know, and I, I read a quote and I'm probably going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll get the, the nuts and bolts of it down. Pretty much social media is somebody's highlight. Reel. You don't see <laughs> right. their blooper. Reel, no, totally. right? You know, and that's how these agencies are. They can go in there and say, you know, and that was kind of the reason I, I had a, a vent, uh, a rant a few weeks ago, but I'm so tired of people saying, oh, I have a 96% close ratio. Oh, I have. And, and David, you were the one of the ones that said, you know, hey, I actually do have some of this stuff, but you know, I, I don't lose business. Like, listen, man, like that's just, if you believe that in your own mind, you are, you are hurting yourself because you have to be real to yourself and you have to understand where your exposure is and where your problems are. And if you just go online and you tout, I'm the best, I'm the best, here's how the best way to do it is you pretty soon believe in it. Then all of a sudden you're in this rut of life that you are truly believing Mm -hmm. is this is the best way. It's the only way because I tell everybody this is it. I got to back it up, you know? So um, the facade of social media, it's it's scary sometimes. And and that's, I guess that's what I was trying to get back to a little bit ago is like, you see all these ideas and groups and products and technology and uh, seminars and whatever. And it's like, it's so easy to be like, well, if I did this, 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 and this, I might be better. But it's like, you just need to take, you know, turn yep. off the screen, look at it. Like, how do I want to get my agency better? Do I want more retention? Okay, let's figure out how to get more retention. Or let's. People just can't be so quick to turn away from the mirror when it comes to problems and look for somebody else to solve mm-hmm. it for them. They, they got to, you know, pull up their jeans, lace up their boots and get out there and figure out what they need to do, you know? So are you guys just personal lines or are you in other niches as well? Yeah, so we are. I just looked at my last pulse report. Ninety eight point six percent personal wow. lines. Okay. So we are personal, personal lines heavy, and it's it's based off you know how we stumbled into the business of my friends being mortgage lenders and a real estate mm-hmm. agents years ago, and I started just kind of learning um, that man, these leads are so much easier because Allstate was real big on this is when you used to be able to do robo dialers. Um, mass mailers of the postcards. So, I mean, I would pump money into these mass mailers and you're getting a one or 2% hit rate. And that's just for them to call you. That's not even a close rate on those. Same thing with the robo dialers. So you're sitting there at six 30 at night trying to talk to somebody while they're cooking right. dinner about, Hey, did you know we have accident forgiveness? And nobody wants to hear yeah. that shit. Um, you know, then on the flip side, I'd get a lead from a buddy and the person would call me and say, Hey, Mike said that you're the best insurance agent in town. I closed this Friday. Can you write me a policy? Not, can I see the quote? Not, can you go over this with me? And so it just slowly kind of just melted into my brain that, man, I close this guy's quotes 75% of the time and they're easier versus begging for these people's yep. business, you know? So the 98.6% personal lines, once I kind of accepted, like, it's so much easier to get referrals and to build relationships that the clients I want, they love eye contact, they love handshakes, you know, this is pre-COVID, um, when you can do all that yeah. stuff, but they, they want a relationship. People want to buy from people that they, they trust, they like, you know, and the consumer I like doesn't care about price to a degree. If their policy goes from 1250 to 1280, they don't care. Um, they just want to know that if they need something, I better be here to answer my phone, you know, and that's, that's what we sell. Like we don't sell travelers. We don't sell Safeco. We don't sell nationwide. If those, one of those three carriers happy to be the best for our clients, that's the policy they get. But next year, if Safeco is better than Travelers and it's a 30% rate increase, we move them because people come to us and people want to work with us. And that's something that I'm really proud that my agency has established is everybody cares. Like on a personal level and at a work level, you know, if we lose a client, my office manager just out of the blue emails me on Friday and says, Hey, one of my employees underneath me, she's been canceling these policies at a too high of a rate. So I had a conversation with her that she's not allowed to cancel any policies unless I look at the deck page first. And that was just one of those like forward thinking things that I was like, 
geez, I wouldn't even have known that this girl was canceling policies at this rate. I didn't know that she wasn't going through the, pro- the, the process you want her to go through to cancel these. But she just saw this as, hey, it could be a problem. I'm going to fix this problem right now before the boss even knows it's a problem. And that is like, like I'm getting goosebumps. Like that, like if I had to like marry an employee, it would be somebody like that and like solves problems for me before I even know I have a problem. And like that is what makes us successful. So back to it, you know, the referred leads, they're great. But if you only have the front end process, like sure, I can give it. I mean, let's be real. People say price doesn't matter. You're right. Price doesn't matter as long as you're in the ballpark. So we always know our, our price is going to be in the ballpark. 99% of the time, our price is going to be in the ballpark. But if they need ID cards and we don't send it to them or their renewal goes up and we don't reach out to them or they call in to make a payment, they don't do that. That's, that's the hard part, keeping them in. You know, it's, I don't care how many clients walk in your front door if they're walking right out the back door at the end mm-hmm. of the year, right? So we shut that back door, we lock that back door and we say, hey, the only way you're getting out of this is if we really did something wrong. And if we did something wrong, we'll open up that back door, we'll have your car ready for you, we'll have it clean, and we're going to try to get you back in a year. But we've just really found that niche market of relationships, which sounds so easy, but so many people want the easy way. They want the click to quote. They want their website where you can submit it and all that. We don't do any of that stuff because me as a consumer, I think I'm a good consumer. I don't want to go on somebody's website and click this and wait for somebody to call me in 24 hours and then have them send me a packet to fill out online. I want the emails. I want the phone calls. I need a quick text message. And if, if they want the help, great. I'll help them. Yeah. So I've got a question. I mean, I think that's an awesome story regarding the the policies being canceled what systems are you using obviously you have to have some sort of a process or your operations person has to have some sort of a process that triggered her to even recognize that that was happening how do you measure all that yeah and so i'm going to sound really ignorant here but she's a go-getter problem solver and she just tells me how to get from a to b so that's what that's what she does she's like Corey, there's actually 31 steps in between A and B, but I'm going to tell you how to get to A to B. So with that being said, underneath her, she's got two employees. One's a virtual assistant that handles all of our renewals. So every night she's in the Philippines. So she essentially gets an email from Easy Links at whatever time it is there, works for eight hours, sends a report in a Google sheet over to Tara, our front office lady. So then Tara has them all color coded where the reds are, hey, we need to do something with this renewal, meaning we need to requote it, meaning they had an accident surcharge, something. Yellow pretty much means, hey, they had a 6% rate increase, but we already told these people they're in the best spot, you're good to go. And green just means, hey, they're good to go. Their rate was 1% up, we sent them their new deck pages, everything's good to go. So they've got a system kind of worked out for them on how it works, and I am extremely hands-off because I don't handle that side of the business at this point in time. Therefore, I don't think it'd be right for me to tell them how to handle their processes and their systems. So I essentially, you know, underneath me, I have Tara and I have Kristen. Tara is my whole operations director. So anything on the operations side, anything after the policy is sold, all goes to Tara. Anything frontline business is Kristen. So she manages all the agents under me. She manages agency Zoom. She manages all of our referrals, our lead sources, all of that type of stuff. So I kind of respect both of them in their roles where if I see like this cancellation thing, like let's say I would have figured out like, why did we lose 60 policies last month when we usually only lose 20? I would have went to Tara and Tara would have had to figure it out. But Tara's just worked for me long enough where she understands me and she knows that, hey, we're seeing these cancellations come through. I'm seeing way too many reds, meaning these people like they're in danger of canceling. And then and I'll ask, I'll actually, I'll follow up with this. I'll figure out what she does at this point because I don't even know what she does. But then... So the people that we couldn't save, they cancel, but she's telling me like, hey, the people that we can't save, there's too many that we can't save. Like this is unacceptable that we can't save that many people a month. So what she's doing to fix this is all new to me. But I just love the ability of somebody to come and say, here's a problem. Here's how I'm going to fix it. I just want to let you know versus here's a problem. Like I hate the here's a problem mentality. It's like, Spend that energy finding a solution, please. Well, it's the difference too for you in being a leader and being a manager. I mean, that's a huge difference. You can run your agency at a high level as long as you have people that have that comfort level of coming to you when there is an issue and taking the initiative to proactively solve it. That's like a dream scenario. You know what I mean? But I got to tell you, man, you know, I made the comment about Apple's and Volvo's. I actually, when you said we lost 60 policies this month, 
instead of 20 policies, I literally had heart palpitations <laughs> hearing those numbers. Well, because, and so it's back to your commercial versus personal though, right? You know? No, well, I mean, it is. I mean, even, even the segment of commercial, us being middle market versus you being personal lines, it's so much more a volume and policy count play. And, and that's the whole thing with us. I tell people all the time, if we write two pieces or, or I'm sorry, two dozen new accounts a year that are in our wheelhouse a year, two dozen in a year, that's Solid a banner year, yeah. year for us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing with personal. So there's good and bad, right? I mean, the good thing is like, if people say, screw you, I'm out. Guess what? We don't care. It doesn't move the needle. And I take that back. We care, but it's not a, not oh my God, you. we have to save this account. Exactly. Right. Um, on the flip side, we go write 10 of those people and it's not a, oh my God, I had a killer month. Like, so it's, it's got its ebbs and flows. It's got its, its forwards and backwards on it, you know, but yeah, I mean, we run about a 93, 94% retention, um, which it's, if you guys use easy links or the other personal lines agents, like it's kind of frustrating because there's not a really good way to dig down and get that retention data because like your traveler's number could be 87% and Safeco could be 87%. But if you would have moved every one of those clients to each other's carrier, does mm-hmm. that make sense? The agency retention is actually a hundred percent, but you're reading on the carrier reports. Oh, I'm only at 87% That's retention. Yeah. So it's a good point. A lot of these numbers, you know, are 98% hard data numbers. Um, but you know, back to what we just kind of touched on, David, I know I'm kind of hopping around. Building the team underneath you is the most important thing in the history of any business, right? Like you can be the best goddamn car mechanic in the world and work on Ferraris, but guess what? You got two hands. And if you can only change one tire at a time, you're going to cap out where you're at, you know, but if you've got 30 hands in there and you've got 30 Ferraris in there, you can make a lot more money, you know? So um, I give my employees a long leash. I've always, my grandpa taught me a long time ago, give everybody enough rope to hang themselves. And that's what I've always really done with people is that I don't care if you make mistakes, but I want you to learn from that mistake. I don't care if you come in late because you were out the night before, just be respectful about it. Like as long as you're hitting your numbers, as long as you're a good positive role in the agency, I'm not going to babysit you because I don't want to be babysat. And like, let's be real. If you guys are hardcore salesmen, you love this stuff. You're never going to work for a guy that says, Hey, why'd you come in at eight Oh five yesterday instead of 8 a.m.? Yeah. He doesn't see the policy. You're like, it's just not in our blood. It's not, it's not how we go. Um, and so it's taken me a long time to find good employees. And I've went through a lot of really crappy employees. Um, but just having people that care and that want to be there, not because they need the paycheck every Friday, it's huge, you know, because if you guys have looked at my pay structure, I give no salary. So they're not here selling. They're not making So how money. do you get people to buy into that culture? It's hard. Uh, it's really hard. So my VP of sales, Kristen, she's been with me for day one. She came to us from being a stay at home mom with no sales experience. So, and now she writes about a half million dollars in personal lines a year. So where, how did this lady with no sales experience, no insurance experience, who had been a stay at home mom for six years, turn into what I would call a top 5% producer in the nation? I'll be completely honest with her. It was purely luck. I didn't hire her. Um, I had nothing to do with her, but when she got into this industry, her father-in-law who, who's successful entrepreneur, he pretty much told her, if you're not going to give this two years, don't take this job because you're going to hate it. You're not going to get rich quick. It's going to suck. And sure enough, about five, six months in there, we hired two girls day one, one of the girls quit. And before she quit, she had a conversation with Kristen and they were both in the exact same spot. This is hard. This isn't easy. This I'm not making as much money as I want to. One girl quit. And one girl's my VP of sales mm-hmm. now, you know, and without getting too personal, she's in a, a, fab, a fabulous spot, you know, emotionally, financially, she, she loves her job, you know. So with that being said, hiring people moving forward, when I was at Allstate, I was very big on come sell insurance, hoorah, this is great, big blues behind you, this is fantastic, free pizza on Friday, you know, you kind of give them all these like fool's gold type shit and people get in there and they're like, this sucks, <laughs> this is hard, you know, it's like, You hear eight no's for maybe two yeses, but realistically, you're going to hear nine no's for one yes. So I totally, when I flipped to this side, I went with the exact opposite side. I said, this is going to suck. This is going to be hard. You're not going to make very much money your first year. You're not going to make very much money your second year. But guess what? You and your best friend start at Cerner. Cerner's a big software company in Kansas City. You guys both start day one. He makes 60. You made 30. That sucks. Year two, he made 63. You made 48. That sucks. Year three, you made 75, he made 69. 
That's good. And I kind of show this, this like this, this plan of if you buy into me, I'll buy into you and I'll invest my time, I'll invest my emotions, I'll invest financially in you, which is I'm about to send somebody, I think, to David's class because they get it. And if they're going to dedicate their time and energy to me and put their financials on the back burner, you know, take one step backwards, get five years forward, I will do that for them. So we have that conversation. Let, let them know, like, guys, I will take care of you if you take care of me. And I do what each one of them needs. And what I mean by that is a 35-year-old that works for me with two kids has different needs than a 26-year-old that's renting an apartment. You know, he needs a natty light, 30-pack on Fridays. <laughs> she needs, you know, a babysitter, right? So, but I'll do those things for them. I see they had a bad month, but their quotes were up and they just, they had a shitty month. I'll throw them a $500 bonus, you know, because I know they need that, right? And I know that his morale on Monday morning being in a good moon is going to propel us so much farther than his morale coming and knowing he came off a really bad yeah. day, right? So I just try to get these people that I like, that I can hang out with. You know, we took our whole team and all their spouses to Mexico in February of this year. It was great. Like we had fun. Like, and I told them before we go, like, guys, this isn't a work trip. Like if you see me at the pool drinking, you don't have to come sit with me because I'm your boss. But guess what? Every day we're all together hanging out just because we like each other. It's that, it's that we like each other. We, we can make fun of each other. We can go out and drink too many beers with each other, but the next day we can come in and, and hit a goal for the sales. So I try to really focus on, and I know I got way off subject, just the type of person they, they are. Um, do they have tenacity? Do they have the ability to get smacked in the face and turn around and, and go find somebody else? Because a lot of people don't. A lot of people want handed leads, you know, and that's what I use the word trained ape. You know, if you're piping somebody full of 30 leads a month, a trained ape can produce for you. It's that simple. But to find a producer that can go out and generate 30, 40 organic leads a month from real estate mm -hmm. agents, that is a diamond in the rough. And they're building their own value. Any of my agents, this sucks. I hope they don't overhear me. If they quit today, they can go get hired by any other insurance agency in town because they literally walk in the door saying, I can write X amount of premium a year. I've done it for two years, and this is how many leads I get a year. Can you imagine if that guy walked through your door right now? You'd, you'd throw your stuff on the floor and let him take your desk, you know? So I implore them to be successful without me, meaning, like, I don't want them to be governed by Casey Insurance Group. Like, you be successful because you're good at what you do. And if you can build that attribute within yourself, you – life in general, let alone work, you're going to have it by the balls. So, A – I would love to have a trained ape in my office. I just think that would be the coolest thing ever. And B, I'm having a hard time getting past the 30 pack of Natty Light. Like you lost me right there. I was off to the lake at that point. But no, really, really, really good points, man. I mean, to me, it, it's obvious that culture does matter to you. And I agree with you. I think it's been cliche and an overused buzzword and misused in a lot of cases. But what you just described, I think a lot of agencies would love to be able to say that they have as well. What I know about that is you don't just accidentally make that happen. It's a series of intentional decisions and a series of opportunities for you to prove your character to your team. You know, it's, it's not, you know, the trip to Mexico and all of that that makes them love you. It's the fact that when it came to you either protected them and did, you know, kept your word to them and honored what you said you were going to do, or you welch on that and throw them to the wolves. That's what leads to having the team the, that you have. You know, it's, it's, it's not the, they, they, the rewards are awesome, but truthfully, the thing that's most valuable to any of us, and I think sometimes more subconsciously than otherwise, is just the security and knowing that you're working for leadership that is always going to do the right thing, even if. It means that sometimes it has to be to their own detriment to follow through on what they said they would do. You know, man, I, I yes. And that's, yeah. And that's just a life kind of motto of mine. I had a conversation with a great friend of mine last week that's very successful, you know, and he, he grew up dirt poor. Um, and long story short, his financial advisor said, Bruce, you need to spend some of your money. He said, he said, do you want to fly private jets or do you want your kid to be flying private jets? Because one of these two is going to happen if you don't start spending some of your money. But we kind of had this, just this overwhelming ability. He has this overwhelming ability that he wants to help others. And whether that means throwing the waitress an extra 20 bucks on the beer because he's having a hard day or donating to a charity for a kid's scholarship fund. So that's what I really want to kind of embody in my life. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to be successful. When I say successful, look, I don't mean $25 million in the bank. That's not my goal. My goal is to live financially free, to have good, healthy family, good, healthy kids. 
but to implore my agents to be good people. And whether that good people means taking your grandma to lunch on her birthday or donating to the local veterans society, that's who I want to bring in here. You know, and to your point, like those are the people that you can transform into the best employees ever, not even insurance agents, the best employees ever, because if they go there and they go through selfless and they realize that everything they're doing is for the better of the agency, which all trickles downhill, like the Mexico, excuse me, like the Mexico trip, they're going to come in there and fight for you every day, man. Like, I, I don't know if you guys played high school or college sports or were in a fraternity or anything like that. You know, it's like, man, like there's no better feeling knowing that you got 20 of your guys around you, right? Whether it's a, you get in a tussle at a bar, you're going to go play the baseball game. It's like that feeling is just, is one of the coolest things ever. And like, I don't want to be cheesy. But like, that's how I kind of feel with these guys, man. When we get these month end reports and we, we killed it. It's like, man, like, let's go. Let's go in the break room, have a beer, everybody. Like, that was a good freaking good good month. Let's go celebrate it, you know? And, and that's what fires me up. Like, I'm a passionate person, high-energy person. And quite frankly, like, money's, like, number eight on my totem pole of why I do what I do. So it's like, I like doing those things of, let's go. It's us versus the world. Like, people say we can't be the best. Let's go be the best. Tell the trained ape to grab natty <laughs> lights all around from the from the thirty pack in the fridge in the break room, right? See, we, we drink alters at the office. Natty lights are lake beer, so we, we try to keep it nice and trim. And- <laughs> there you Dude, go. So, so do you? Listen. So, I've got to ask: is the is the land shark hooked up now, or what? Are you good? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're good. We're good. Um, you know, it's interesting. So we put in an outdoor area. In our house, and we've I got. I saw that. I'll, I'll give you some barbecue lessons. I saw those ribs yesterday, so I'll give you some barbecue <laughs> lessons for free. Yeah. So listen, we have the. Um, we had a, a double kegerator put in, and let's just say that if you're not used to the whole CO2 tank and getting <laughs> all of that stuff, you know, hooked up the right way, it's a bit of a process to get that whole thing dialed in. So like we had so much foam at the top of our, <laughs> our beers for the first little bit. I finally got it dialed in just in time for everybody to come over for uh, football yesterday. So it was cool. But anyhow, listen, we've been going an hour, Corey. I want to be respectful of your time, Kyle. I know you got to get off to get to another appointment. I know that you shared enough nuggets of wisdom on this episode that people are going to want to reach out to you. So why don't you tell them the best way to contact you and then we'll sign off. Uh, email, Facebook. So Facebook's just my name, Corey, C-O-R-Y, Schnabel, S-C-H-N-A-B-E-L. Or my email is just Corey, C-O-R-Y, at KC, like Kansas City, KCinsured.com. Cool. Awesome, man. I don't have any cool hashtags or Instagram pages or anything like that, so. You don't need it, man. You're a cool guy without all that stuff. Listen, really good conversation, man. I love uh, what you guys are doing. I look forward to continuing to follow you and would love to have you back on down the road to find out how uh, how much you guys have progressed over the last little bit. But really appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend an hour just telling us all the cool things you got going on. Yeah, you as well, guys. I, I hope to see you in Tampa later this year for the, the There you go. Well, yeah, you know, either the Chiefs game or innovation, I'm going to be here for both. So you're welcome anytime. Hopefully the Chiefs play in Tampa twice this year. So. <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> what, There you go. Sounds good, man. We'll talk soon, brother. Have Thanks. a good week. Later. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. See you. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>